All right, so here we have the quintessential. It's a surprise party. Um, I got a this list off of the swaddle.com. Again, way to find good, reliable sources for this. But I mean, a lot of these web pages have been kind of distilling down, um, you know, polls and other things. And so I just grabbed it. It works. Um, so one of the reasons why surprises aren't always fun is because it gives a person a sense that they're off balance, right? They've got this loss of equilibrium where they're like, I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what to pay attention to, right? Like they don't know what to focus on. Um, and then there's this sudden loss of control, right? Like you walk into what you think is your house for the evening and then all these people are here yelling surprise. Right? Um, it can make you feel like you're not in charge of your own destiny or your own outcome and, and that can be perceived as unpleasant, right? Um, and then it can cause anxiety. You know, am I acting right? Do I seem appreciative? What if I had started to pick up some hints that this was going to happen? And so I wasn't completely surprised. Did I fake it well enough? Um, there's like all of these little anxious parts about it. You know, maybe if you're not the biggest, most sociable person, and then all these people are at your house for your birthday party that you didn't know was happening, um, you might feel like it's um, a big burden, right? It feels like a lot and you'd rather not be doing it. Um, maybe they invited too many people. Maybe I'm na um, naturally an introvert and I don't really like gatherings that have more than five people here and you've invited everybody from the office, right? Um, so there's just this sort of loss of control that can generate anxiety. And, you know, that's why a lot of people find it, you know, I would like to add in, and this was not on the swaddle list. I was kind of surprised because if I, the only person that it felt like I'd been tricked, you know what I mean? And, you know, maybe... Maybe I wouldn't feel that defensive about it today as I did when I was like a 12 year old who, you know, knows everything because I'm 12. Um, so, I mean, it might have just been my my moment in time, but I definitely felt like everybody else was in on the trick and I was somehow like the brunt of their joke because they all knew something that I didn't know. So it wasn't on the swaddle list, but I know that's one of the things I don't like about surprise parties is, you know, that sense that the person might have that they might feel like that. Um, okay. Okay. Let's move on to fear for a second. Now I'm not going to show you this one because this is actually a compilation video. So it could go on for quite a while. So I'm just going to show you the first video and I don't, I don't know if it has any sound. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the um, microphone on for the, for the sound and then we'll see. I'll, I'll be back. Nick. What? <laughs> Okay, so that poor lady falls down. So I don't, I, we have to stop before anybody gets hurt. But um, what I loved about the man sitting in a chair and the spider, a fake spider comes down and he notices it. And did you notice that his feet were turning? In fact, I'm going to let her run while I'm talking because she does the same thing. So you see the person on the right is going to jump out and startle the lady on the left. So, okay, so see her running in place to the point where, and I think she was taking a kick at the one on the right. So that's why she fell down. Um, you can't blame her for, you know, you get startled that badly and you do want to lash out. And all of this is really good evidence that the sympathetic nervous system gets kicked in when you get startled or scared and you're going through the motions of like wanting to flee. So you see the man sitting in the chair, kicking his legs like I'm going somewhere. You see this lady like running in place, right? It's really common with fear to see a person going through the motions of a flight. Um, so when we're experiencing fear, it can be a very brief experience. Like I think in both cases that you just saw in those videos, part of why it's funny is because the fear, once they realize that, oh, it's a fake spider or it's my friend who, crouching in the kitchen, um, they go from actual fear to now kind of mad or, um, you know, now it's moved into something that, you know, we're not watching a person who's really in the midst of, of something truly terrifying. Um, so it can be very brief. And then when they recognize that it's not really, a, um, a threat, then they can kind of move to the next thing of like relief or anger or whatever they're going to move to. Um, or it can be a longer duration, right? Like you can spend an evening on pins and needles prowling around because you heard something and you're like, I'm pretty sure there's somebody outside. You know, I'm going to close all the curtains and turn off all the lights. I'm going to go from window to window, looking outside, trying to be like, this could last for a little while. Oh, this is perfect timing. There's a spider crawling up my wall. So perfect timing. Um, 
I'm trying to decide whether I should pause what I'm saying or, or just go on with it. Cause I mean, it's the size of an ant. I mean, anyway, so, um, but you, it could be a long period of time. And in fact, if it goes on more than just like these acute, very much, um, triggered by something that's going on right now, that might be frightening. If it's something that goes on over time, we're moving into more of the pathological version of fear, which we'll talk about in a little bit. It can be a weak fear where you're more like, maybe we'd describe it as startled or something like that, or it could be very intense, like terror. So, you know, fear is different from surprise, right? Cause it can be a, a much longer emotion um, and it can have different degrees like surprise. There's um, probably a little bit of a variation in the degree of surprise that you're experiencing, but not much difference in, in the duration. It's usually a pretty brief emotion. So that's one thing that sets fear apart from, from surprise. So since I asked if surprise is always pleasant, I thought I'd flip it and say, well, is fear always unpleasant? Cause it feels like one of those things that we would lump into the category of unpleasant emotions, kind of, you know, like who wants to be scared? Well, all of us sometimes, honestly, um, you know, sometimes we might be seeking out controlled fear and suspense because we know we're safe. We're sitting in a movie theater. We know that this was, these are actors and stuff, but you still get swept away with the storyline and you get you know, empathetically scared along with them or, or the, the movie's set up to startle you on purpose and, and things like that. And, but, but you know, you're basically safe. Like nothing's going to happen to you in this, in this theater, um, unless this is some kind of meta experience where you're actually being filmed for another horror movie or something, <laughs> but really, and honestly, um, that's one of the great things about horror movies and scary books is that you can kind of control it. Um, there was an old episode of friends where, uh, Joey had been reading Cujo and, uh, one of the friends found it in the freezer and he was like, it got really scary. So he stuck it in the freezer so it wouldn't get him anymore. Right. Um, that's the beauty of reading a book or watching a movie. You can, you can pause it. You can put it in the freezer. You know, you don't have to sit there and be scared anymore. Um, and so it helps you to kind of master your fear response. Um, you also, when you do scary things, uh, you get a rush of adrenaline. You get this big release of endorphins when you survive the scary thing. You get this dopamine that is very rewarding and makes you want to do the thing again. And so all together, it, after you've lived through it, you're like, whoa, that's the greatest thing ever. Oh my gosh. So pumped up, such an affirmation of life, all these great things. Right. And so a lot of times people do on purpose, scary things because they have been in the past rewarded for doing those scary things by getting doses of endorphins and dopamine. Endorphins, by the way, are your, um, you know, neurotransmitter that basically makes you not feel pain. Um, can make you feel euphoric. Dopamine is also, an, it's it's called our pleasure, um, our reward center, right? Where you do things, get a burst of dopamine, it makes you want to do it again. It's very rewarding. Yeah. So yeah, jump out of, of the plane again, right? A lot of times people do fearful things, you know, things that could be fear inducing because they want to push the envelope. You know, they want to have a thrill. They want to see how much fear they can tolerate. Like, can I handle it? You know, what, what will be my limit? You know? And so they want to test themselves just to find out, um, you know, you might want to engage with the unknown and, you know, see what happens so you can really start to understand, you know, the world at a deeper level. Um, you know, a person who goes swimming with sharks might have already watched shark shark week, already saw them swimming in a tank. And they're like, I just want to see what happens when I'm actually in their environment. Right. I want to see what they look like up close, see them at their own level, that kind of thing. Um, and I would just guess that the next stage in, in these people who are in the cages life would be not, you know, swimming with the sharks, not in a cage, you know, like going to coral reefs where they know that sharks, they see there's a spider again. It's taunting me now. I think it's trying to see how, if I'll squeal like a scared person. Oh, perfect. So I took a gesture at it and now it jumped down and it's down behind my desk. So, um, it's probably gonna climb up my leg. Perfect. <laughs> the final um, explanation for why people like to do fearful things is that they um, oftentimes misattribute the arousal that they experience while doing something scary to arousal that's being generated by the person that they're with. And so they say, oh, look, I'm all scared. I'm all pumped up. I'm experiencing these endorphins and dopamine. Hey, I'm on a date with this person. So this person probably generated all these endorphins and dopamine in me. Like I'm excited because I'm with this person. And so that misattribution makes 
for a great first date, right? Where you've gone to a scary movie and now you both look more attractive to each other. You've gone on a scary roller coaster ride like these people. Um, that helps to boost attraction to each other. So that's another benefit of, of fear is that it can boost attraction. I would like to argue that any emotion that, you know, activates your sympathetic nervous system would um, cause the same kind of misattribution. So, you know, doing something exciting, doing so going to a comedy club and really laughing hard, any of those things could also work. So you don't have to do something scary. So let's talk a little bit about the times that fear can become pathological. Um, now, I was sitting in on a thesis defense where somebody from outside of psychology um, objected to the word pathological because she felt like it was labeling. Um, I'm not trying to label. I'm using the word that is used for uh, those circumstances where a person has behaviors that are not healthy, that are maybe symptoms of mental illness or something else. You know, um, see, I'm not as happy about the term me mental illness as I am with the word pathological. So I guess we all have our preferred words anyway. Um, anxiety disorders are maladaptive versions of an adaptive fear response, right? Like we've, throughout the Ekman book, he's emphasized how our emotions are adaptive. Like they're here because they help us to survive, help our species to survive. And so when we look at anxiety disorders, you've got what could be an adaptive behavior. Like it's, it's good to be scared of, ee, <laughs> The spider got on me. <laughs> was perfect timing, spider. Seriously. Okay, I told you he was going to climb on me. I told you that. Anyway, so uh, I love summer. Summer is great. Um, so not wanting a spider on you is an adaptive fear <laughs> response. I'm not sure what the hoop was that I made and the spaz out gestures I made. I'm glad the camera's not on right now. Um, <laughs> how adaptive those were. But I did get them off of me in that process. Don't worry. No spiders were hurt in my defense. Um, but so that response that you don't want a spider on you, that can be very adaptive because some spiders have venom and some spiders bite us, right? I don't think this one that I'm scared of has that, but um, so that's, that's good, right? That you don't want spiders on you, but anxiety disorders are where you take that natural thing and now you've blown it into something disordered where you're like, I can't even exist in a world where spiders are. Right. Like if I had a spider phobia, the fact that I had seen him in two different places and he kept disappearing would have been enough to make me pause and leave the room and, you know, get the exterminator in here. And I can't live in a world in which I know that there is a spider somewhere that I can't see. Right. Like that's an anxiety disorder. Um, my natural not wanting him on me, that that's the adaptive part. So what we're talking about in, um, you know, fear responses or, or all emotions, right, is the sympathetic nervous system getting activated. And that's normally going to help us in a lot of situations. The general dis definition of anxiety disorder would be um, any kind of psychological, any kind of um, anxiety that is interfering with our function in everyday life situations. Like for example, if I couldn't come back in this room until I knew every spider was dead, like that'd be an example of, you know, it would interfere with my functioning. Um, overreacting when something triggers your emotions. So it's not just that I'm scared that there's a spider in here. It's like, I am like, in a panic. I'm crying. I'm shaking. I've got a bunch of reactions. They're out of line with the possibility that there's a spider in the room. Uh, and the thing is you can't control your responses to these situations. It's a lot of times when we see a person who is truly phobic of something, we think just stop reacting like that. It's fine. Uh, I'm going to logically tell you that there's nothing wrong and you're fine. So stop being so scared. And, but they can't, they can't control that response. It's not, it's like the sympathetic nervous system has kicked in they are now limbic system driven and there's nothing that no logic is not going to work. So there are some factors that affect our susceptibility of developing an anxiety disorder, personality traits, like people who are really shy or who display other kinds of behavioral inhibition, um, are more likely to develop anxiety disorders. Um, people who have experienced stressful or traumatic events early in childhood, especially also in adulthood that can set up some, some kinds of, um, anxiety disorders. The, the big anxiety disorders typically are more associated with, with, um, traumatic events in early childhood, really like, especially early childhood where you're not even really talking yet, or really not your, your true memory hasn't really kicked in yet. Um, that's the prime time for setting up anxiety disorders. And then a family history of anxiety or other mental conditions has been associated with personal development of anxiety disorders. It's um, as if the 
genes may have just set you up for a disorder. It doesn't, you may not have the same one that, that your family member has, but it's sort of manifests in each person individually. Might be genetic, might be, you know, household environment. It's very difficult to say exactly what role family history plays. You know, is it a biological role or is it, um, you know, more of a nurture role, but we see like it running in families. And then physical conditions can give you these sympathetic nervous system effects that then can make the person think, I'm feeling like this because of anxiety, right? Not even though that's not why they're feeling like that. They're not feeling like that because there's something scary. They're feeling like that because their thyroid is overactive, for example, or their heart is beating at a strange um, pace and they don't know that that's a biological fact for them. And so when they feel their heart pounding, they think, well, I must be scared right? Because we talked about these theories of emotion in the past, right? Where I have these sensations in my body, I must be experiencing fear, or I must have just taken a run, or I might, right? Um, and so they're explaining their physical experience as a result of um, anxiety. All right. So hopefully a lot of you are already familiar with these things through your training in psychology. But um, when we talk about the different types of anxiety disorders, I just really wanted to emphasize that you could think about all of them as being a maladaptive attempt to regulate your emotions. So if we talk about generalized anxiety disorder, a lot of times a person who has just this general sense of doom that something bad is going to happen, um, they're trying not to feel like that by ignoring it or by breathing steadily or by doing aerobic activity, or they're, they're trying not to have that experience. Um, they're trying to regulate that emotion, but they're not really addressing the cause of the anxiety. And so it's not making it go away. Um, panic disorder is, you know, an acute event where your um, heart rate accelerates, your breathing shallows, your palms get sweaty. You might have um, shivers or muscle twitches, or um, you might have chest pain and think you really are having a heart attack. Um, just all of these symptoms. And it can, it's a very acute onset. And usually there's nothing that precedes it that would, would warrant that kind of response. A lot of times a person has a panic attack while they're sleeping or when they just started, you, I finished all my studying for the exam. I'm going to relax over some Instagram feed. And then all of a sudden they have a panic attack. And they're like, I'm not even nervous right now. Why is this happening? And that's a good way to tell that it's a disorder and not a real reaction to something. Um, phobias, there's all different kinds of phobias. And when we talk about them, what we're typically talking about is a person who has placed all of their anxiety onto a particular object or situation. And they're like, if only that object or situation didn't exist, I would never feel like this. And so they're trying to regulate their emotions by saying, if I could just avoid that target spider or public speaking or whatever it is, if I could just avoid that, I would never feel like this. And so they're trying to regulate their emotion through controlling their environment. Separation anxiety, you know, a lot of times we see this as a very normal reaction in small children, but as we get older, we're supposed to be able to be autonomous and not feel anxious when we're separated from our comfort object or person. Um, so uh, it's, again, an attempt to regulate emotion by saying, okay, I feel fine as long as my object or person is here. If I'm separated from that, I, I can't actually regulate my emotions correctly. Post-traumatic stress disorder is, again, uh, one of those situations where the person's trying not to be having this profound reaction following some kind of traumatic event. They're trying to put it out of their mind. They're trying to move forward. They're, but they're not addressing the, uh, uh, the basic issue, and so they're having difficulty regulating their emotions. They have a lot of vigilance, for example, or um, that's their attempt to control their feeling of anxiety. So they check all the locks, they check all the doors, they pace around, they can't sleep well because they're like, if I could just reassure myself that there's no danger, then I won't feel anxious. But of course you can't really reassure yourself that there's no danger. And so it's always niggling in the back of their minds. Um, and so it's another example of, you know, attempting emotional regulation, but it's really not working. And then obsessive compulsive disorder is where you have thoughts that are scary um, or disturbing, um, you know, that I've got germs on my hands or that, um, I might burn down the house or, um, I might give people food poisoning with my poor food handling skills or, or something like that. You've got this obsessive thought and it causes you to engage in compulsive behaviors as an effort to sort of get those thoughts to go away. So if I'm worried that I have germs on my hands, I may compulsively wash my hands thinking, well, if I reassure myself that my hands are clean enough, then I, those obsessive thoughts will go away. 
Uh, unfortunately, they don't usually go away. They escalate. So it's like, okay, it's not just my hands. It's now it's up my arms or it's on my face. And next thing you know, I have to take a full body bath in pine salt in order to convince myself that I'm actually germ free for a few minutes. Um, it, again, it's an attempt to regulate emotions by saying, if I can control how many germs actually are on my hands, then I'll be able to get rid of these anxious thoughts that I'm having. And it, it just doesn't really work, but that's what they're trying to do. So this is what happens when fear sort of goes out of, you know, alignment with what's going on in the actual environment. And so I just thought I'd hit those really quickly. All right, let's go ahead and stop here and we'll come back in the next segment. We'll talk about contempt.